Let's talk health matters now. And this time we're delving into fibroid management and the treatment options of which are available. Of course, if you do know that this is one issue that uh, many women have had to deal with uh, in recent times. Uh, Dr. Abayomi Ajayi is joining us now in the studio. He is the managing director of Nordica Nigeria. Thank you so much, doctor, and welcome to the studio. My pleasure. Great to be here. Great to have you. So, I, I mean, I'll start from the fact that uh, I've heard a lot of myths around fibroid, you know, um, some of them spiritual, some of them religious, <laughs> some of them traditional as well. And some have given interventions both traditionally and otherwise. But it, it would be good for you to lay the ground first and tell us exactly what we are trying to manage before we talk about fibroid management. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, fibroids are lumps that grow in and on the uterus okay or the womb okay and they can be numerous they can be solitary they can grow to very large sizes that sometimes are confused as pregnancies and they're probably the commonest growth uh, in the female reproductive uh, organs in nigeria and in africa um we don't know why they're there but we know that they, it's both genetic and hormonal and uh, so uh, it said about 70 to 80 percent of women below the age of 50 in Africa have fibroids so it's a very common thing and therefore the management is also very very important right. to both the doctors and the women as well right. You know, uh, it's scary when you say you don't know. You are a doctor and I'm expecting to say, okay, doctor, you're telling me this is what causes fibroid. Avoid this, avoid that, and you don't get it. Uh, but here you are telling me we don't know why they are there. It could be this, it could be that. And that is why it's scary for women, particularly when they say the only option is for you to go for a surgery and women are like, oh, no, I'm going to die. So please break it down for us. Is it a curable kind of uh, issue for women or is it something that can be prevented? Okay, yeah, when we say we don't know, does not mean that we don't know the risk factors. You know, <clears throat> what we're saying is we don't know why A has it and B does not have it. Okay, specifically, we That know means it's not true that every woman has got it or would no, have no, it at no. some point. No, in, I just said 70 to 80 percent. Okay. So that means some people. So are that's fed. a myth somewhere. No, no, it's not a myth. No, oh, what people say that oh, every that everybody, woman no, that's has a myth. got that. There is nothing that everybody has. Okay, in the world ahead. so okay so but we know that there's some risk factors okay we know that as a woman gets older the risk of having fibroids increases we know that being black increases the risk of uh, fibroids we also know that being obese increases the risk of uh, uterine fibroids we know also that if you use contraceptive pills you increase your risk of having fibroids but the probably the, the biggest risk is when uh, you have a family member, either a mother or a sister, who has fibroids. So, yeah, we know some of the risk factors for fibroids, but we don't know exactly why it's not everybody in that family, for example, who will have fibroids. Mm. Okay, it, so, so okay, let's... Let, 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 sorry, colleague. That aspect of the... Let me just come in here because okay. it, it also addresses, you know, some sort of myth. Now, we, we hear about cysts, okay, and then we hear about fibroids. And, you know, for a lot of gynecologists, when they explain this to women, even in 1919 and all of that, they say, you know, it doesn't stop chances of getting pregnant. However, there are risk factors that you mentioned. But what is the difference between the two and how much are they aligned to each other? Okay. Actually, they're, they're world apart. Okay. okay. Uh, a cyst is a collection of water. All right. So, and usually it's on the ovary, not on the, on the uterus, but the ovary and the uterus are neighbors. So sometimes they might be confused initially for one another, but that's what a scan, a, an ultrasound scan, will usually differentiate quickly. Okay, so is this curable? Oh, yes, it is curable, but the, 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 as we go on in the discussion, the, you will see that the problem is that there are different ways of treating it. The cure for fibroids is to remove the uterus. All right. Remove the uterus. Entirely. Entirely, because mm -hmm. that's cure. But because we, if you still want to have a baby, then that is not an option. And so that's where all these other things, which we call uterine sparing, that is the, the ways to spare the uterus 
that we don't want to get rid of the uterus. That's where even the surgery that we call myomectomy or removing the fibroids and leaving the uterus behind now comes in. So there are ways to manage, but the only cure is to remove the uterus. Are there other options for treatment without going for surgery? Of course, of mm. course. Uh, and um, if we look at it from the point of view of when we are going to, there are many ways which we might be able to talk about. But when we want to consider what ways to constitute for a particular person, one of the things we need to say is that there is no one size fits all. For you know, in those days when you have fibroids, is more you must have surgery, but not in 2023. For the sake of me, there are many options now available. But there are four things that the doctor wants to look at before telling you what your options are. You want to look at the age of the person. Okay, because sometimes you mm -hmm. don't even need to do anything. All right? F a typical example, say the woman is about 46, 48, she has fibroids, and she's not having symptoms. You just probably did your annual medical and you found, found fibroids it. there. And it's not even big up to maybe about 5 cm and then she's not having any symptoms. Such a woman, you don't need to do anything about her. You can just follow up to see, is, it, is she developing symptoms? Or, because menopause might soon come, and then we know that because fibroids are hormone dependent, they tend to either reduce in size at menopause. So you might not do anything for such a woman. So that's also one way of managing. But there are other ways. You could also use drugs. All right. But also there is a small subset of women who can benefit from drugs. Either those who want to go to, for surgery and they are shrinking, or that kind of woman that I just spoke about who menopause is just nearby and you can use the drugs because the drugs will starve uh, the fibroids off the food I eat, which are the hormones, and make it look as if she has uh, reached menopause and the fibroids will not grow further. Okay, okay. so let, let's come in here because I hear you talk about um, you know, the age groups here, yeah, uh, from 40 to 50 upwards. But then um, uterine fibroids, you know, tend to have occurred in much younger people. And I've, I've heard details of that. And the, the idea that it suddenly begins to make people understand that it happens to women of childbearing age and not just a, an age group is also quite, for some people, um, alarming. So you find a lot of people going in for uh, tests again and again, hoping to see, you know, some elements or some uh, outcome of fibroids, you know, uh, mentioned in their, in their uh, consultation. But I would want you to really explain because the types of fibroids and their management. I mean, I've heard of um, some mucosal fibroids. I've heard of about a few of them. But each of these types of fibroids, do they have the same kind of management or the same kind of Medicare? Wonderful. Um, there are three types of fibroids, okay. Uh, the fibroid, depending on where they grow in the part of the uterus, the fibroid that's the commonest is the one that grows in the muscle of the uterus. We call that intramural fibroids. The ones that the next one is the one that grows outside the muscle of the uterus. We call them subcellular fibroids. And then they are the ones who grow in the cavity of the uterus where the baby stays. We call that submucous fibroids. Okay, the most um, troublesome are the submucous fibroids. Uh, thankfully, they are the least common of the fibroids. Uh, but now, you know, I was talking about what the doctor looks at, the factors that we look at. We look at age, uh -huh. we look at whether you have symptoms, we look at whether you still want to have a baby, and then we look at where exactly the fibroid is located. And these four things can make you to decide what kind of treatment to give to a patient. Okay. Okay. So even surgery, if you're going to do surgery, these factors will determine what kind of surgery you can do for such a patient. Because even surgery has evolved over time from being, when we say surgery, that we must cut you open, to what we call plain hole surgery, okay. Okay, whereby we do laparoscopy or even hysteroscopy. Laparoscopy means that we go through the uh, navel, just under the navel, and we're able to go into the abdomen and even do surgery, we can remove the uterus through that. We can remove the fibroid through that. Depends on who are we treating. Does she still want to have children? How old is this woman? So the, the, even the surgery that we offer would depend on that. And then we can even do hysteroscopy, which does not leave any scar. We go through the vagina into this cavity of the uterus, if that is where the fibroid is. And then we can shave the fibroid off 
from there and we leave no scar at all. But all these surgeries still require that you go under anesthesia, mm. okay, which is one of the problems with surgery. Okay. But now we have now gone to the realm of non-invasive methods of treating uterine fibroids where you don't need to sleep, you don't, no blood loss at all, and then and you go home that very day. And so that is what we're talking about now, that for people who qualify, there is a non, completely non-invasive, not minimally invasive, but non-invasive method of treating uterine fibroids. How can anyone in need access that? Well, uh, for now, there's, there's only one machine in the whole of West Africa right now, and that is a, in Lagos right now. But the good news is that one is coming to Abuja pretty soon. Um, How so soon? F matter of months. Okay. Um, not up to six months. Yeah. One should be coming to Abuja. In because in Lagos, we have done 385 cases in about two years and four months. And uh, that, uh, it might not be eye-opening for somebody who is not a doctor, but I, I, don't, I don't see... How many doctors have done 385 fibroid surgeries in their lifetime? Mm. You know, if we can do that in about two years, uh, four months, then that's really, I, I think, is a, so is a clear wonderful thing. They are all successful. Yeah. Mm. All, all, all. all right. So I, I know there are some women out there who are watching you now who want, you know, um, to get access to this and then get their problems solved, particularly those in the age bracket you talked about, between 40 and 50, and still where the risk is higher, but they still want to have children. Uh, does, it stop it, uh, does fibro stop a woman from having children? And is there anything you can do if you still want to have children, uh, you know, and you don't want this fibro to be a disturbance for you? Well, the first thing is that um, uh, this procedure, HIFU, can be applied to all age group. It's not only for the 40 to 50. Now, for one of the things, again, to clarify is that fibroids rarely causes infertility. But fibroids is associated with infertility. I hope that is clear. It's only about 3 to 5 percent of people that fibroids causes their infertility. Most of the other people is that it's associated with infertility. And therefore, one of the things we tell patients is that if you cannot get pregnant, don't just hold the fibroid responsible. You need to do a comprehensive fertility assessment because, you know, in, in this country, I, can, I mean, we know that about 40 to 60 percent of infertility is due to the male factor. So because the woman has been waiting to have a baby, she develops fibroids. And if all your attention is only on the fibroids, you are not looking at the whole thing holistically, and then you'll be missing a big chunk. And then finally, when you get rid of the fibroids, then that's when you now start seeing the, the yeah, problem. That, problem. So hmm. it's always good if your problem is that you can't conceive to have a holistic assessment for infertility rather than just facing the fibroids because what we see is that now when we've treated the fibroids mm -hmm. the woman can't still get pregnant mm -hmm. and so she's disappointed and she says oh no and you see there's a way that infertility mm. uh, uh, does actually that's one thing that i'm paying so much attention to now how infertility affects the psyche mm, the mental health exactly the mental health of, of patient yes especially women. But even men, we say in infertility management that the forgotten male, mm. most of the time attention is focused on the woman, but the man also has his own issues that he's facing. Mm -hmm. So to look at the mental health, the effect on the mental health of All people right. who have infertility. Some of the times we often say even the males sometimes live in denial until it's very already too late. Well, thank you, Dr. Abayami Ajay. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, he's been talking to us.